It's one minute past four, so let's start. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's online seminar on numerical linear algebra. We're very excited today to have Christian Lubig of the University of Tübingen giving the talk. Christian uh, has received many awards, including the Dahlquist Prize of Siam, and he was a plenary speaker at the ICM in 2018. He is widely recognized for his work on the numerical analysis of differential equations. Uh, he made, for example, uh, important contributions in geometric integration for structure preserving algorithms, uh, exponential integrators with Krylov subspace approximations, extending backward analysis to ODEs, and many more. In addition, he has written three books and numerous overview papers, many of which have become standard references in their fields. In much of this work, uh, Christian succeeds in combining numerical linear algebra with ordinary differential equations. This is probably already obvious from my bias selection of his contributions that I mentioned earlier, but it's also true for the topic of his talk today, which is about low rank approximations via differential equations. Uh, as usual, uh, you are encouraged to ask questions in the Q&A of Zoom and the chat of YouTube. Your questions and remarks will be monitored by Daniel Kresner and Melina Freitag, and they will ask them uh, to Christian at certain times during the talk and at the end of the talk. Uh, and with all that, we are ready for your talk, Christian. So please uh, go ahead. Well, thank you for the invitation and the introduction about. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I will tell you about low rank approximation of time dependent matrices and tensors. And this is a topic where I have had the good luck uh, to work. Ah, what happened? I must do it this way. Uh, to work together uh, with uh, excellent co-authors, starting from the 2007 uh, paper uh, together with Otmar Koch, down to my recent, my current uh, PhD student, Gianluca Ceruti. Uh, well, on this list, you find people uh, well known in your community, in the numerical linear algebra community, Bart van der Eiken, of course, uh, Ivan Ozeledets. You find some uh, physicists, you find some chemists, so it's a wide mix, and I've really enjoyed the collaboration uh, with these uh, re researchers. So let me first give you some motivation. Why would this be of interest? Uh, let me begin with something which you might attach the title of information retrieval. Uh, consider an, an encyclopedia, and first of all, think of something which is carved in stone, like the Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, you want an important object there is the term document matrix, uh, which tells which term appears in which document how many times. And so this gives you a matrix. And of course, this is a very large matrix. And you, one usually tries to keep the information content, uh, but with small amount of data. Uh, and so there's this technique of latent semantic indexing, which is nothing else than a patented version of the uh, single value decomposition. And so you just com uh, compute a truncated SVD. Now that's fine for something which is fixed. But now think of a time dependent encyclopedia like the ones you're using all the time, like Wikipedia or something else. Uh, you would still like to work with a, a reduced data matrix, uh, but it's just not feasible that uh, every second or every minute you will compute a new SVD of these large objects. So what you would like to have is an updating procedure which works just with increments. So this is a situation that we encounter here. And the aim here is data reduction in a time dependent setting. And here, the object is given A of T, 
would be then a time dependent uh, term document uh, matrix. Whereas in many other situations, A of T is not a given object, but it's the unknown solution to a differential equation. And then the goal is not data reduction per se, but it's also model reduction because you would like to compute a data reduced approximation to the solution of the differential equation uh, <clears throat> without first compute solving the differential equation and then do the, data, uh, do the reduction in data. And this is in particular important in high dimensional evolutionary partial differential equations. Let me give you some examples. Uh, one that uh, we came up recently was kinetic equations. Uh, they are like the Vlasov equation, Boltzmann equation. There the object that one is interested in is the particle density function, which gives the probability density that a particle gives the probability density of particles at position x with velocity v at a given time t. And now going back to this time honored technique of separation of variables, one can try to approximate this by a product of functions which depend only on x and only on v. And both of these functions may depend on, are in addition time dependent. Uh, now, instead of just taking one of them, you can take several of them. And this is then very close to what we have here. If you think of x and v as discrete variables, then uh, you're in a situation as above. But here, the particle density function is not a high dimensional function, which is given a priori, but you just know the differential equation. Now, similar work has been done on, pre actually previously, uh, in random evolutionary partial differential equation, where u of x and t is the solution of an evolutionary partial differential equation, but depending on a, 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 rand a random parameter uh, omega in, a, in some probability space. And you want to compute such a random solution. And again, you can do a refined separation of variables. Uh, you uh, end up with a reduced model by a low rank approximation. So here we just separate, like in the matrix case, between two variables. But the problem which actually brought me to this topic was quantum dynamics of several particles or many particles, where the object that one wants to approximate is the wave function, psi, which is a solution to the Schrodinger equation the time when the Schrodinger equation. And this wave function depends on the coordinates of all the particles, which are independent coordinates here. So it's a high dimensional function and on time t. And it's quite remarkable that chemical physicists came up in the, already in the 1990s with low rank, which what, with what we would now call low rank tensor approximations to uh, solving approximately this problem. Uh, they created what's called the multi-configuration time-dependent Hartree method, uh, which is now considered as the standard for quantum molecular dynamics. Uh, since about 2005, 2006, matrix product state and tree tensor networks have been booming in the quantum physics uh, community. And there again, one tries to find a low rank approximation in a suitable tensor format to the wave function of a Schrodinger equation, in that case, typically for lattice systems. Okay, that gives you some motivation. Now let me come to the outline. Uh, I will first tell you about this dynamic low rank approximation, what I understand by it. We will see that this leads to differential equations. First, as differential equations in a somewhat abstract setting on the manifold of rank R matrices or of uh, tensors of a given rank. 
and this has to be broken down to uh, something which one where with which one can really compute so we'll get differential equations which then have to be solved numerically and now standard integrators applied to these differential equations tend to fail spectacularly uh, and they will propose you uh, describe you uh, an integrator which suits reduces the structure here it's a projector splitting integrator which has uh, the feature that it is robust to small singular values and small singular values uh, are typical to appear we will see that uh, and they they pose a problem to standard integrators uh, I will concentrate my talk on the matrix case that's not because actually most of my uh, research in recent years has been on tender cases but for the presentation uh, it's just simpler to work with matrices than with tenders uh, well you should just have two indices instead of three or several indices but uh, there's more to it but at the end i would like to show you that what i told you of the matrix case essentially all extends to tensors and tree tensor networks so that's the program. Let me begin with this dynamic low rank approximation. So what we're aiming at is, suppose we are given a matrix A of T or a family of matrix of time dependent matrices A of T. And we are looking for an approximation of rank R to it. Of course, at any time T, we can compute the best approximation, say, in the Frobenius norm. And this is given by the single, by a truncated singular value decomposition. So you compute the singular value decomposition, retain only the first uh, R, largest R singular values, and discard all the others. And this is the best approximation that you can have. And the norm in this talk will always be the Frobenius norm, which is Convenient, uh, what's important uh, is not that it's the con uh, uh, Frobenius norm, but it will be important that it's an inner product norm and the Frobenius norm certainly is the simplest one of that. So the best approximation is that matrix in the manifold of rank R matrices, which is as close as possible with respect to the Frobenius norm uh, to the given matrix A of T. But this would require computing the single value decomposition at any given, at any point t. Now we will replace this by something else, which formally looks quite similar, uh, except that in instead of looking for the low rank approximation directly, I look for its de uh, time derivative. So I'm looking for a rank R matrix y of t, such that it's time derivative, which then must lie in the tangent space at the current approximation y of t, is such that it is as close as possible to the derivative of a of t. So formally, it looks quite similar. You just added a few dots. But it's a substantially different, different thing. Here, this is something which is pointwise at every t. Here, it's a differential equation on a manifold. Now, why would one, would one do that? Let me give you two points of motivation. So here it's again this dynamic low rank approximation. First of all, what we have here, that element in the tangent space, which is as close as possible to a dot of t, that's just a linear projection of a dot of t onto the tangent space. So we have to just a linear projection here, whereas finding the best approximation is a non convex minimization problem, which in the case of matrices happens to be solved by the singular value decomposition. But even for tensors of order th uh, three, the, it's a non-convex minimization problem for which you don't have a closed uh, linear algebra solution. And the second point is probably more important. This approach extends immediately to matrix differential equations. I mean, suppose A of T is not given explicitly, but it's the unknown solution of a matrix differential equation, say an initial value problem where A of T, T zero would be given. 
uh, but otherwise A is the solution, the unknown solution of a high dimensional uh, matrix differential equation. Now to compute a low rank approximation to this A of T, you could first solve this differential equation and then do a single value decomposition at every point T in which you're interested. But that's not an efficient way to do. Rather, let's go to this point. Uh, well, A dot of T should be F of A. Of course, we do not know F of A, but we replace it by F evaluated at the current approximation F of Y. And so we are looking for that element in the tangent space. This defines my velocity. Y dot of T is defined by that element in the tangent space such, which is as close as possible to F of Y of T. So we were looking for that element in the tangent space, which has the smallest residual in the differential equation. Okay. Now, let me just give you a picture to understand what is here. It's not just an advertisement for a blue book, but there's an important picture. So here we have our manifold. And we have an approximation y at time t. And then the question is, in which direction do we go further on this manifold? Now, f of y would point outside the manifold. And what we do, we project f of y to the tangent space. Then we are tangent to the manifold. And since this is, there, is at every time, we stick, we stay on the manifold for all times. So we replace the original differential equation, a dot equal f of a, by this projected differential equation. You can view this as a Galerkin approximation on the tangent space. And this is actually not a new idea. It goes in the context of quantum dynamics for a very particular approximation. This was used for the first time by Dirac in 1930. And uh, in physics, this is well known as the dirac Frankel time-dependent variational principle. So you look for an approximation on a manifold, and you just project uh, the vector field down to the tangent space. Let me also note that if we have a linear differential equation, like the Schrodinger equation, the approximation here typically gives rise to a nonlinear differential equation, because even if f is linear, the projection is nonlinear. So there are several equivalent formulations which I would like to collect here. So this was the first formulation. The time derivative is determined as that element in the tangent space, which is as close as possible to the time derivative of A. Well, by formulating the minimality condition here, you see that you can view this as a Glurkin method that the residual y dot minus a dot should be orthogonal to the tangent space at the current position. So it's a Glurkin method, but with a solution dependent approximation space. And as we have already seen, this is nothing else than y dot is the tangent space projection of a dot. And actually, all three formulations are useful. That maybe is the, the first one, maybe is the most intuitive one. That one will be useful for deriving differential equations uh, with which we, we for uh, the factors uh, in a low rank uh, decomposition, in the, for a low rank matrix. And this looks as the most abstract one, but we'll see that it will, will be quite a useful one. So, well, what we have here is a differential equation on the manifold of rank R matrices. This is quite an abstract thing. It's not something where it's clear how do we compute with that. So first of all, how do we compute with low rank matrices, matrices of rank R? Well, the most natural thing to do is to use a single value decomposition where one has a factorization of a rank R matrix in to matrices U, S, and V transposed, where U would uh, contain the single, single vectors, so it has orthonormal columns. V 
would sim similarly be a matrix with uh, orthonormal columns. And then in the singular reality composition, S, of course, is diagonal. Here, we do not require that S is diagonal. It should just be invertible to have a rank R matrix. This will be useful uh, for the differential equations. Uh, and the methods we develop uh, later. So it's something like uh, an SVD, but we do, do not impose that this small R by R matrix is diagonal. Of course, if we want to have it, to have the full SVD, we just diagonalize this small, uh, we, we just compute the SVD of the small uh, matrix. This, this would be cheap, but we do not impose uh, the diagonality of S here a priori. So we are looking for now for time dependent matrices Y of T, and then both the basis matrices U and V would be time dependent and also S. And then it turns out that this dynamic lowering approximation can be translated into differential equations for the factors U, S, and V. And you get an approximation if you, namely exactly the dynamic low rank approximation that they pre, uh, described to you previously, if you, V and S satisfy these differential equations, uh, well, what do you see here? You have, of course, time derivative, A dot. So recall Y dot should be as close as possible to A dot. So A dot has to appear somewhere, it's here. Uh, and what also appears is the inverse of S, both S, both of S and uh, the inverse of S transposed. This appears on the right-hand side of these differential equations, and this will cause some pain. Now, if A, this was a situation where A of T is given explicitly. Uh, if A of T is not given explicitly, but this the unknown solution to differential equation, you just replace the A of A dot by F of Y. And otherwise you have the same differential equations. Now, using these differential equations, you can derive error bounds for this low rank approximation in terms of the best approximation, possibly also not just the best approximation of Frobenius norm, but also best approximation, which uh, takes also into account the approximation of the, deriv of the derivatives. And surprisingly, these error bounds, they are error bounds which also work for ill-conditioned S, which is not obvious here because an ill-conditioned S um, can may, uh, you see this causes, causes problems for the differential equations here and might also cause problems for the differential equations. Uh, in our first works, we always assumed F uh, to be non-stiff, so to have a local Lipschitz constant. Uh, very recently, Diana Conte gave a nice paper where she extended our results to a stiff situation uh, of for, of for equations of a parabolic type, where we have something like a discretized uh, Laplace operator and a nonlinearity. Uh, now let me come to this inverse of S. Uh, we have seen our dynamic low rank approximation yields differential equations for these factors with the inverse of, of S appearing on the right hand side. Now, the bad news is S is typically ill conditioned. Uh, I would all even go so far as to say, if S is not ill conditioned, something is wrong with your model. Uh, namely in the following sense. If you want a low rank approximation, which has good appro uh, approximation properties, then this can be only obtained if you discard, if the discarded uh, singular values of the solution are small. So the R plus first singular value of the exact solution of the exact matrix A should be small. But then typically there's no reason that the rth one is much larger. And even if, the, if there is a gap, typically you don't know at which index r this gap is. But when sigma r of the, is of the same size as sigma r plus one, and sigma r plus one determines your 
accuracy that you can obtain with a lower rank approximation, then necessarily sigma r must be small if you want good, uh, have good, good accuracy. So the S that appears there is always ill-conditioned. Now you might first think, well, maybe it was just this particular way of writing the approximation, and there's even some freedom in formulating the differential equations. Maybe you can get rid of this ill-conditioning. But no, this is not possible. There's a geometric obstruction to it. Namely, the inverse of the smallest singular value of s, or uh, the smallest non-zero singular value of y, uh, corresponds to the curvature of our manifold. Uh, now, curvature, uh, uh, think of the curvature. Curvature has to do with how the projection to the tangent plane changes. Uh, so high curvature means a high Lipschitz constant of f. And if sigma r can be arbitrarily small, we have here a manifold of arbitrarily high curvature. Now, I don't know if you can see me, I give you here a model of a manifold with very high curvature. It's a crumpled piece of paper. And now remember our tangent space projection. If I go along this manifold, the tangent plane moves very rapidly. So you might ask, is such a tangent space projection approach, as I told it to you before, is this a reasonable way to deal with such a high, uh, high curvature manifold? And indeed, for a general manifold, this is not the case. But on the other hand, physicists have been using this and given, given the name of Dirac Franklin time dependent variational principle to it and have been using it for uh, 90 years now with great success. So there must be something behind that. And the good luck is that this crumpled piece of surface, uh, piece of paper is a very bad model for a low rank manifold. I'll show you a better model. Here it is, it's a ruled surface from our collection of uh, uh, geometric objects uh, in our library. Uh, it's a root surface like a hyperboloid. And now why can we hope that this gives us something better? Uh, well, here you can go from one point to another just along flat, flat lines, just along straight lines or along flat surfaces. And this is indeed something which happens here. So when we then come to a time integrator, it would be good to have a time integration method which reflects this structure, which only goes along flat subspaces and never really comes to see the, <coughs> the curvature. If you just go along a straight line, you're somehow blind to the curvature around you. If you think of a very narrow, uh, very of a hyperboloid, which becomes very narrow, so it's almost two cones, there you have extremely high curvature. But if you just go along a straight line, which defines uh, this uh, hyperboloid, you're somehow blind to it. And actually, this is this is what comes to save us, uh, comes to save actually the whole approach of uh, low rank approximations. I think not only the dynamic case, but uh, I think it's equally important in the optimization case, although I don't know of any literature about that. Okay. So now let's come to time integration. We have these differential equations. We need to solve them numerically. And let me first, ah, yeah. Let me show you uh, an integrator that we have devised. And which just falls almost if comes to mind immediately if you look at the third of the three characterizations of this dynamic Lorentz approximation, namely y dot is p is the is the tangent space projection of a of dot. Now at first sight, this looks like the most abstract formulation among the three ones, 
but actually one can give an explicit formula for this orthogonal projection. And it's then alternating sum of three sub projections. And what we do now, so this P, uh, the, the, the P with this index R of yt is that's the projection, the range of y transposed. Similar here of the projection, the range of y, and here they have the sandwich. And all we do is we use a splitting method where we first integrate just the first part, then integrate the second part, and then integrate the third part. This is now such splitting integrators are very popular, but we will see that really this is the integrator for the problem. It's not obvious now, but uh, I will try to make you understand why I underlined the the here. Now, so what we do in the abstract form, instead of solving one differential equation, we solve three differential equations. For the first term, for the second term, and for the third term, and always the initial value for the second differential equation is the result of the first one, and so on. This is known as lee trotter splitting, and there are refined versions of that. Now it turns out, if you look at these differential equations, you can solve each of them exactly in a very simple way. And here's the practical form of this projector splitting integrator. So we start from, we do one time step, say going from an approximation y0 to an approximation y1. And we start from such a factorization and it denotes by delta a the increment of a. So I first consider the case where a of t is given. So the algorithm will actually not need a of t, but it will just need the increment. And then you have a, you can consider both together u and s and update their product. And then you do a QR decomposition, we might also do an SVD and get a matrix with orthonormal columns and the small R by R matrix. So you see, this only has to do with a long thin matrix. It's not the full matrix that we are act here, but this K1 is just a long thin matrix. You just need a few matrix vector uh, products here. Then we update S and then we consider V times S transposed do a similar updating step as in the first one, but now for the transpose, we orthogonalize again. We get again a long thin matrix with orthonormal columns, and we get an R, R matrix as one. And now U1, S1, and V1 define our new approximation. So we get we start from an appro a lower rank approximation in factorized form, and we update this factorization using just <clears throat> matrix vector product here, a QR decompositions of long thin matrices. So this is uh, the amount uh, of work is here, M times R square or N times R square. Uh, and what's quite typical, and extends also to the tensor case, we alternate between updating and doing an orthogonalization step. That's quite typical of the these projector splitting integrators. Now, this is for the case where A is given explicitly. If instead we have a differential equation, well, then we solve a differential equation for an R M by R matrix. So again, a long thin matrix. To uh, the orthogonalization, then we have a solve a differential equation for S and solve a differential equation for L. And of course, these have to be solved numerically, but now there's no S inverse here. You can use a standard Gromi Kutta method. Uh, and if, if your equation is non-stiff or an implicit one, if, if F uh, is stiff. And you can also use a symmetrized var uh, variant, uh, which gives you higher order, such as a strength splitting. Of course, to make use of this, uh, it would be good if F can make use of the factorization. And 
that then depend very much on the applications. Now, why would one use such a projector splitting integrator? Excuse me for a moment, I will just try to take, take the sun out. Okay. Now, what I will show you is that this projector splitting integrator has a property that, it disting that distinguishes it from all standard integrator. Namely, it is robust to the small singular values. So let me go back again. We have these differential equations and there's the S inverse. Now maybe you've already noted then it, that in our projector splitting integrator, no inverse of S appears, but there's still the QR decomposition uh, which might be ill-conditioned. So how does the numerical integrator behave when S is ill-conditioned? Let's just do a numerical experiment. What I've considered here is a cooked up example of dimension 100 by 100, where the singular values uh, decay geometrically like uh, with powers of two. So we have essentially <clears throat> singular values two to power minus J for J going from one to 100. And this is multiplied with some time dependent function. And uh, we, well, we have skewed this so that uh, the problem is not uh, completely trivial. And we apply a standard fourth order ruin kutta method to this. Now for rank four, this is quite fine. But if we have rank eight, <clears throat> then we have smaller singular values in our approximation. And already at 10 to minus two, the Runge-Kutte method becomes unstable. So beyond this point, the method becomes unstable. Now you could say, well, it's an explicit method, take an implicit one. Well, it, then it doesn't go unstable, but the, the result just becomes wrong. The, that's not much better. If you increase the rank, because you would expect, would like to have higher accuracy, then it doesn't go beyond 10 to minus three here. And for higher ranks, 32 or 64, we couldn't even compute it. So we would need very tiny step sizes to get a stable approximation here. On the other hand, this projector splitting integrator that I described to you is completely insensitive to these small singular values. Recall if I have, uh, <clears throat> if I have uh, rank 32, then I have, uh, singular values of uh, down to uh, size two to minus thirty two two. So in in on the or some, somewhat close to ten to minus ten. And we see we get close to the best appro uh, approximation error, which would be on the order of ten to minus ten, already with very large step sizes. So here with uh, this standard uh, Runge-Kutta method rank, uh, we would have to have step sizes on the order of 10 to minus five. Here we have more. Uh, note by the way that uh, the scale, the vertical scales of the error are not the same uh, in, in both. So these lines correspond to each other, but here are a few more, more lines. You see that even with high rank, you can go. You might be surprised with also why the error goes up when you increase the rank, the reason is simply here you are already in the range of round off errors. And the smaller you make the steps as the more round off errors you make and therefore the error goes up again. So what we observe here in this numerical example and in many others is that this projector splitting integrator is robust to the small and single low values. Well, that's nice to observe, but why is this so? Uh, Sorry. <clears throat> now, this projector splitting integrator has remarkable properties. One of it is that if I use this projector splitting integrator to approximate a matrix A of T, which already has rank R, then this integrator is exact. This is an amazing property, which no standard integrator applied to these differential equations would have. And in particular, it's exact 
And of course, this, this is exact, uh, even if the uh, singular values are arbitrarily small. So this is not an obvious result, uh, because if I change the ordering of the three, of the splitting to the three projections, we have this k step, this step for s and this step for l, but if I do the splitting in a different ordering, this result holds no longer true. So we came across this when we first found that the numerical results were much better than, the, than we expected. And then we came up to a, with a quite short proof, uh, a quarter of a page. It's a very simple proof, which absolutely gives no insight. Uh, you compute the error, and at the end, the error consists of six terms, which cancel pairwise. So the error is zero. Uh, I would like to have a better and more geometric understanding of why this happens. But anyway, it's a nice result. And using this result, we get an error bound, uh, which is independent of any singular values. And this was joint work with Emil Kieri and Hannah Wallach. And I don't want to go into the details. Uh, well, there are some details. So here's our error bound. There's a quantity epsilon. Epsilon is a bound on the normal component of our vector field. You recall we project f to the tangent space to stay on the manifold. And if f has a large normal component, you cannot expect uh, good accuracy and epsilon measures this normal component. So the error is proportional to this normal component and to the step size h. So it's only a first order error bound. But the important thing is the constants here are completely independent of any singular values. These singular values can be arbitrarily small. Uh, I cannot give you the proof, of course, here in this talk, but there are two ingredients. One of them was the exactness results, result that I gave you. And the other property is just the property that if you look at what this projective splitting integrator does in each step, it moves along a flat subspace of this manifold of rank R matrices. And in this way, this high curvature of the manifold due to the small singular value does no harm. That's somehow the intuitive way. Now you have trans uh, to translate these uh, statements into a sound analysis and that's what we have done. So in the end, the root surface saves the day. Uh, I was told that it was usual to put questions in between. So let me give you a chance to put some questions now. Is okay. there any question? Yes, uh, there's one on the, in the Q&A on Zoom. And the question is about the uh, uh, projector splitting method. So there were three equations. And uh, the question was, can one solve these equations implicitly, especially for the second equation, so for the equation for S? Uh, you were referring to these? Uh, now you had uh, one slide before, I think. No, here's nothing to solve. It's an explicit update. Yes, exactly. So I think the question is, let's put it more generally, can you use an, an implicit method here as well? No, you, this is the exact solution yeah. of the, okay. the sub-step. Uh, you, you wouldn't like to use an implicit. So here's the situation where A of T is given explicitly. Okay. And all that appears is the increment. And that one is an exact solution to this first differential equation. In that case, you can just solve it ex uh, directly, exactly, without any extra error. Whereas for a general situation where a dot is, uh, where you have a differential equation for a, uh, you have to solve a differential equation here numerically, which you can do by explicit or implicit methods. Okay. Okay. I, I think that's. You have complete choice, uh, complete freedom in choosing your favorite method for solving these equations. Okay. 
And then I had a question by myself. So at one point you said uh, uh, we use the Frobenius norm for convenience and it's important that's an inner product norm. But the Frobenius norm has a second property that it's a tensorized norm. So what happens to your techniques if you use a non-tensorized norm? Okay. Uh... Yeah, let, let me take, uh, <laughs> I, I agree, that, that's also very convenient, but I, I, I could take a, a weighted Frobenius norm or, or something like that. No, it was a more serious question, so because, I mean, you run into problems with the SVD, the SVD does not exist anymore, I mean, there's no generalization of the SVD to non-tensorized norms, but your projection on the tension space, that may still work, I, probably. That or does still uh, work? Uh, uh, I must say I've never thought about that, and uh, I, I, so an an ad hoc solution that I would propose to you is quite uh, probably a wrong solution. So I refrain from doing that. Okay, good. I think there's also a question on YouTube. Um, yes, well, there's more like a comment from someone from the, uh, from Jarek Duda, who seems to be working in the machine learning community, and he says uh, this approach looks very similar to online PCA. Um, so maybe you can comment on that, or maybe you've heard of that, uh, where they uh, um, they update the dimension at uh, at every step. Why? I, I've talked to people from machine learning. Uh, they told me uh, that. Well, I told them about my. Uh, uh, work and uh, they told me that this might be useful in uh, what they call online learning. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they call this online PCA, it seems. So there is a relation to that. So, um, okay. okay, so I mean, that's a way to do this online PCA in a numerically sound way. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to continue, if that's okay. So I now just praised this project, the splitting integrator. Uh, there was one property which we didn't like about it. Uh, when uh, Gianluca Ceruti, uh, my current PhD student, and I looked about it, at it, uh, there are situations when <clears throat> uh, you want to approximate symmetric solutions or skew-symmetric solutions, or which is in particular important in the tender case where you had have fermionic systems, bosonic systems with, with, which have a symmetry or anti-symmetry. And the projector splitting integrator doesn't preserve that. And this led us to another surprise, which I present you now. Namely, we came up with another robust low rank in, uh, integrator, which has somewhat the same ingredients, but uh, in a uh, in a way uh, in a way that's different. So we still have this differential equation that we had for the projector splitting integrator, but now we have the differential equation for L in parallel. So there can be done in parallel, which is not so much of an issue, maybe for matrices, but which may be an int uh, interesting feature for the tensor extension. Uh, we orthogonalize again. We completely ignore the R factor of the QR decomposition and only use the basis, orthogonal basis vector to solve a Galerkian system of F in the basis created by U1 and V1. So these are the differential equations for S. And this way we get again uh, u1, s1, and v1, which updates our approximation in factorized form. So it's, it has somewhat the same in ingredients, but uh, as a projector splitting, but it is no projector splitting, it's different. And if you look, it has a few nice properties that a, a projector splitting integrator does not have. If this differential equation has a symmetric matrix as a solution, then this new integrator preserves the symmetry or this, the same for the skew symmetry. What's also a nice property is that for the projector splitting integrator, we had a minus sign here. 
So it was going backwards in time. And such a step backward in time is not desired when you solve, say, parabolic problems. And uh, as anyone in numerical analysis learns very quickly, if you want to have a stable in, uh, integrator, don't use sub, uh, don't solve sub problems which are ill-conditioned. Ill and so the minus sign in the projector splitting integrator can be problem is no problem at all. Say in applications to uh, quantum physics, when you really want to have a time evolu evolution, but for computing ground states or uh, excited states, where you have a parabolic-like equation, this can be painful. And this new integrator has no backward step. And it has more parallelism, which can be exploited. On the downside, it's only a first order, and it's not quite clear how this can be extended to higher order. But on the other hand, the robust error bounds that we had for the projector splitting are also only first order. Now, the nice pro uh, thing about this new integrator is it has the same exactness property and the same robust error bounds as the projector splitting integrator. However, to prove this, we have to make use of properties of the projector splitting integrator. Uh, we have limited numerical experience with that. It seems to work in a very similar way as a projector splitting integrator but it might be an interesting alternative in some cases. So this is a very recent, very recent work. Now, so far I've told you about matrices, about, about low rank approximation of time dependent matrices. Uh, now for the rest of the time, uh, I would just like, well, essentially I can, I could make it very short and say, all I've told you about matrices can be extended to general tree tensor networks. Uh, that's the shortcut, but as I have maybe two, more, two, two, or, two or three more minutes, uh, let me say something more to that. So we can consider tensors in Tucker format. Uh, well, if you see formal uh, slides like that, then you understand uh, why I chose to stick to the matrix case for a non-expert audience, uh, otherwise I would have to explain uh, these symbols. But if you are familiar with Tucker tensors, you recognize it immediately. Now this dynamic low rank tensor approximation uh, has been extended already uh, 10 years ago in joint work with Otmar Koch. Uh, and also more recently, this uh, projector splitting integrator has been extended together with its nice properties. We have again, this exactness property and we have the robustness to small singular values. Here is small singular values of metrizations of unfoldings uh, uh, of the Tucker tensor. This has also been used in chemical physics, by the way. Uh, then there are tensor trains, or as physicists like to call the matrix product states, which you can view as a non-commutative separation of variables approach, where you take as an approximation uh, to uh, a general uh, d-dimensional tensor, a product of one-dimensional tensors that would be classically separation of variables or rank one. But uh, now these are not scalars, but are matrices of, of compatible dimensions. This has become very attractive because it has a very low data requirement. And uh, there's been an enormous amount of literature on these tensor trains or matrix product states, both in the mathematical and the uh, uh, physical literature. And again, the dynamic low rank approximation could be extended and also the projector splitting integrator uh, together with its uh, <coughs> exactness and uh, approximation properties. And this, has also been carried over uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the quantum physics. Uh, this was the only time uh, in my career that I made the experience that I gave a talk and two weeks later, someone had implemented the algorithm and wanted to apply it to his physics problems. That happened here with Jutta Hagemann and a nice quantum physics paper came out of that. And very recently we have generalized this to general, we have extended this to general tree tensor networks. 
or like here where each of the inner nodes corresponds to a tensor, a connecting tensor, and the leaves here correspond to uh, basis matrices uh, with orthonormal, uh, to orthonormal basis uh, matrices. Now, such more general tree tensor networks, I think the first term they were used, though not under this name, was in the chemical physics community, but by what people call the multi-layer MCTDH method. And uh, since about 2006, uh, there came the notion of a tree tensor network in the quantum physics uh, community. Again, this has been uh, extended. Uh, the projector integration, uh, projector splitting integrator have been extended to general tree tensor networks together with their properties. So we again have this exactness property and we have the robustness for small single eventers. Well, this was what I wanted to talk to you. So I first gave you an overview of what we know about dynamic lower rank approximation in the matrix case. I told you about the differential equations, which have this unpleasant factor of the inverse of this ill-conditioned matrix S in there. We have a projector splitting integrator, which is robust to the small single level values, which typically appear. And we could extend this to tensors and treat tensor networks. That's the end of my talk, but if you allow me, I would like to make an advertisement. I have a free postdoc position uh, for two years in Tübingen, for at least two years in Tübingen. Uh, it's free from October 22 onwards, so it can, uh, or, uh, or can be started later. What's require, required is uh, someone who has done good research numerical analysis. And what we also need is uh, some ability to teach in German. If you're interested, or if you know someone who might be interested, please send me an email. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Christian. Thanks for the very nice talk. So there have been a couple of questions. Um, so one, big issue and you're certainly very aware of, but there are two questions on this one from uh, Fenjan uh, Lee and one from Bart van Eigen is that you could maybe comment a bit on rank adaptivity. So how do you choose the rank uh, in the beginning and uh, adapt it in the okay. course of the method? Uh, I mean, it's, there's no problem in reducing the rank because well, this is just checked by the singular values which are available. The problem that can appear is in increasing the rank. And now what we do is we just, uh, let me see where, let me go to the projector splitting integrator. The nice thing is we can solve these differential equations or let me go to uh, this one. Suppose we have computed up to rank R so far, and we would like to continue with rank R plus seven. Then we, we embed this, make a step with this for rank R plus seven. And then the integrator itself creates new directions. This seems to work quite well, but we have no theory about it that indeed it works it chooses the good directions, but it seems to work better than just choosing uh, random directions. The integrator, see, if you have start with something which has a uh, lower uh, rank, due to this update, you will increase the, have something which is higher rank and due to the orthonormal generalization here, you get new basis vectors. And this can be used to adapt the rank and it, it ha this has been used also in this chemical physics codes, uh, codes uh, with some success, but uh, with no theoretically understanding at all uh, as to why uh, these directions that the integrator chooses are possibly good directions. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was a question by Volker Mehrmann. So 
what happens if the singular values r and r plus one are equal? Nothing. That's uh, r and r plus one. No, there's no. That doesn't appear. That that is a problem if you insist on a coalescing singular values pose a problem if you insist on having a diagonal matrix S. And this problem is circumvented or is eliminated by instead just taking any invertible matrix uh, S here. Let me go back. I should have mentioned that the differential equations which appear here are actually quite closely related to differential equations for uh, a continuous singular value uh, decomposition that have been derived uh, in the uh, around 1990 uh, or in the 1990s by people like uh, Dieci and Airola. But they really worked with a singular value decomposition. So with a diagonal matrix here. And then this breaks down if the eigenvalues coalesce. These differential equations break down only uh, if uh, S becomes uh, singular. Mm -hmm. But of course, it becomes ill-conditioned if S has small singular values. OK, then there's uh, one more question in the Q&A. I don't think there's any problem if the R and the R plus for first uh, single value coalesce here. Yeah, it came from the alpha of the analytic SPD, so <laughs> no surprise. Uh, someone is nervous about double singular values. Uh, there's one more question or a few more questions now in the Q&A. Uh, one is, are you aware of um, that somebody has tried to use this concept of dynamical rank if you impose further constraints on the factorization, specifically if you use a non-negative factorization? No, that would be very interesting. Uh, in, in, indeed, we have uh, done some first thoughts on it, but... Uh, I haven't really uh, pursued it, but of course, also with you on the next talk in the series, that would be a, a very natural combination, but uh, it's, it's not obvious how to do it. Okay, and then there's one question about, are you aware that someone has tried to combine this concept of parallel and time integration with uh, dynamical low rank? I'm not aware of it, no. Uh, I mean, our new integrator has something, some flavor of that, but uh, I do not know uh, of anyone who, 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 who would have who would have done that. Yeah. Okay, and then there's another question by Bart, uh, and uh, so I mean, there's this ALS techniques uh, which you can use for lowering approximation or solving optimization problems yeah. on low rank manifolds. And somehow projective splitting also alternates between uh, two uh, or three equal entities. So the question is, is there a connection between dynamical low rank and ALS, maybe for T going to infinity or? Uh, formally, as T goes to infinity, yes. Uh, I mean, in the joint paper with Bart uh, that we have with the, uh, with the physicists, uh, the, uh, the catch line really was that to change uh, uh, DLRMG code, which implements this uh, ALS technique for uh, optimization. You just had to add, uh, I don't know, was it five lines of code or two lines of code, uh, and you had the, the, the integration uh, procedure. So formally, they are very similar. But actually, uh, for a uh, time, uh, also in discussions uh, with Bart, we had hoped that we could use uh, the results for the projector splitting integrator, this exactness and robustness results, do you pro to prove uh, analogous results for optimization? Where, to my knowledge, there is not uh, much, uh, has not much, uh, is not uh, has not much been done about uh, approximation on low rank manifolds in the presence of small singular values. Mm -hmm. uh, However, uh, uh, we, uh, we have failed gloriously so far. Uh, we have gained much insight, but no result. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melina, are there questions on YouTube? Um, 
thank you thank you for the nice talk uh, there are no more questions on youtube so in the interest of of time i would just head back to either you if you have more questions on zoom daniel or to bart if no no uh let's hand back to bart okay uh thanks christian for this very nice overview and thanks everybody for uh, attending and asking questions let me show you the program for next week and for our next speakers after the break. So as you can see, we have another talk on low rank approximations but now non, on non-negative matrices of Michael Eng. Uh, and then we have a small break and in September uh, we come back. So thank you all for attending. Thanks uh, Christian for the talk and have a nice day. Bye.